Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming to our webinar today, Cannabis Regulation, High Time for a Public Health and Equity Approach. Uh, we know that public health and social equity have been receiving intense scrutiny in our nation lately. So this is why we're taking the time to look at the regulation of cannabis, particularly recreational marijuana, through this lens. As Stephanie mentioned, I'm Kara Cork, Senior Staff Attorney at the Public Health Law Center, and I'll be your moderator for this hour-long webinar. Uh, we do want to add that we've applied for CLE credit for this session. Next, please. As Stephanie mentioned, um, we're here from the Public Health Law Center, which is a national nonprofit organization at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota, located in the Badote region of the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. Our Center of Attorneys and Public Health Health Analysts supports public health and commercial tobacco control policy change at the local, state, and national levels. Next, please. We do this by providing free legal technical assistance to public health advocates and professionals. Next, please. At the uh, around the United States in several ways. Uh, we don't represent clients in court and we don't lobby. Finally, our organization is committed to the principle that good public health cannot be achieved without addressing health equity. Next, please. Okay, that was my brief introduction to the center. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce our two presenters today. Our first presenter is Dr. Lynn Silver. Lynn is a pediatrician and public health advocate who serves as a senior advisor at the Public Health Institute and also as a clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Lynn directs the Prevention Policy Group at the Institute and getting it right from the start, regulating marijuana to protect youth, public health and equity. Lynn's an expert on the use of policy approaches to prevent chronic disease. And before she joined PHI, she served as Assistant Health Commissioner of New York City under Mayor Bloomberg, leading groundbreaking work such as the nation's first trans fat ban, calorie labeling law, and the National Salt Reduction Initiative. Also in California, she served as County Health Officer in Sonoma County, and she founded and co-chairs the California Alliance for Prevention Funding. Next, please. Uh, he's one of the few other attorneys and public health analysts at the Public Health Law Center that work on areas where marijuana and commercial tobacco control regulation correspond in some way. Uh, Hudson's also an environmental law attorney who has presented and published on issues relating to hazardous tobacco, e-cigarette, and nicotine waste. Before he joined the Public Health Law Center, Hudson worked as a public interest attorney with a focus on environmental law, consumer protection, and government and corporate accountability. Next, please. <clears throat> Before we begin, I'd like to set the stage briefly because it keeps shifting. It seems as though each day more states are passing, revisiting, and refining cannabis laws and regulations. So this is just a quick snapshot of the legal landscape in the United States as of July 2021. Uh, at least uh, 19 states to date have legalized recreational use of cannabis, including DC, the Northern Mariana Islands, and Guam. Medical use of cannabis is legal in 36 states, including DC, and four out of the five inhabited territories. And finally, 13 states and the US Virgin Islands have decriminalized its use. So who knows what this map is gonna look like in another few weeks or months. Next, please. Also a quick word on terminology. As I'm sure you know, decriminalizing marijuana is not the same thing as legalizing it. Decriminalization means removing criminal penalties, such as prison for certain drug activities, normally personal drug use and activities like possession and cultivation for personal use. And that's just not the same thing as making it legal because the state could issue civil penalties. Decriminalization is often enacted independently from legalization and legal regulation. Legalization, on the other hand, is the removal of state penalties for cannabis activities, such as production, distribution, possession, and consumption, and generally replaces those penalties with regulations on commercial cannabis activity. Next, please. 
So one more thing, although uh, Lynn and Hudson will be talking about uh, principles related to cannabis, I just thought it would be helpful to include a few of the, the guiding principles that our center uses for approaching public health issues, uh, particularly those on controversial and complicated topics such as marijuana regulation. As I mentioned earlier, our center not only supports the idea of using law to improve public health and health equity, but we also promote evidence-based policymaking, local control, and regulatory environments that promote public health and safety. Our center uses these principles to guide our policy work in tobacco control. And next slide, please. Most recently in fielding questions related to laws and policies regulating marijuana. Here are just a few of our resources on this issue. Uh, they're all available on our website along with archived webinars. And as Stephanie's mentioned, um, this webinar is being recorded in the slides and the recording will be available on our website very soon. So with that, I'm gonna turn the podium over to Lynn. Lynn. Thank you. And let me share my slides here. Um, it's really, um, it's fun to see the, the overarching principles for the Public Health Law Center because I feel like it's a really good match with the approach that we've been taking on this issue. Um, and that makes me happy. Um, so with further, without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go quickly and try and do sort of a, a high level overview of a number of the issues. And, and Hudson's going to take a more focused approach on um, applying these issues to a specific reality of Michigan. Um, so we're excited to be here with all of you today. So first, um, as um, Carrie mentioned, I'm uh, coordinating something called Getting It Right from the Start, which is a pretentious name that we landed on right after Prop 64 passed in California. But uh, as we saw um, legalization moving forward without really due attention to the issues of protection, protecting public health, we started this project to really develop and test models and provide technical assistance on what might be cannabis policy that could better protect public health, youth, and social equity. Um, we've worked with over 100 jurisdictions in California, across the nation, and Canada, and produced model laws for California cities and counties and, and other tools, that some of which I'll show. Um, so first, what was driving legalization, both decriminalization and legalization in the first place, and are our current policies fixing them? Um, you know, so the underlying drivers led many of us to support a change in policy was first and foremost systemic racism in drug policy enforcement and the incarceration of a, you know generations of um, black and Latino youth um, for minor offenses like possessing cannabis um, that was just unacceptable. Also the huge amount of violence associated with drug trafficking both in the United States and other countries that have been supplying the country um, and the fact that prohibition as a social policy was just not working. We had very high levels of use despite prohibition. So um, like alcohol prohibition was not um, a terribly effective social policy. But um, I think what we're seeing more and more driving the most recent legalization campaigns is increasingly clearly the emergence of a powerful and profitable cannabis industry as well. Um, so the, the motives behind many legalization campaigns are also shifting now. And what we're seeing more and more is this emerging um, policy juggernaut of the cannabis industry. So why we still have federal illegality and a policy, we have a policy of federal forbearance where they're not intervening in state legal markets, <clears throat> but the cannabis industry is increasing its political power very quickly. And the latest coalition that was created, for example, nationally to lobby for legalization is led by companies like Altria, one of the world's largest tobacco companies, and Constellation, a major alcohol company. Um, and they are putting strong pressure on for both state and federal legalization, um, as well as a global uh, footprint of legalization. So just um, first of all, should we be worried about this? Marijuana does have some clinical benefits, and we will doubtless find more clinical benefits from this fascinating um, plant over the coming years. Uh, it's licensed for chemotherapy-induced nausea, for certain rare and difficult to control forms of epilepsy, certain forms of chronic pain, uh, cachexia, which is wasting with certain illnesses, 
um, multiple sclerosis associated spasticity, um, but these are not the most common problems. Um, but we also need to recognize that marijuana um, is associated with substantial evidence of harm as well. These include low birth weight when used during pregnancy. Most concerning uh, to me, I believe, is schizophrenia and psychosis um, increases with use, uh, increased motor vehicle crashes, especially with co-use with alcohol, respiratory illness, including severe lung disease with vaping, um, and the emergence of dependency and problem use, especially when people start young and use frequently. We're also seeing a whole body of other evidence emerging around long-term cognitive, academic, and social effects, growth in cannabis use disorder, which is the name given to dependency, um, accidental ingestion and overdose, and some cardiovascular effects, including arrhythmias, heart attacks, and other events in young people who would not normally otherwise be having them. Um, nevertheless, the worst cannabis health related effects probably still come from people going to jail um, when they shouldn't be going to jail on this issue. And we have seen an uptick uh, in the last years of the Trump administration in marijuana arrests, which had fallen uh, significantly in 20, um, from 2013 on. Um, they fell, but they never really went all the way down. So they fell about 20%, but not, um, they certainly didn't disappear. And then they went back up again. Um, we have persistent, huge racial disparities in arrests across the country. California has greatly decreased its rate of arrests, but there's still almost a two to one ratio um, in arrest rates for blacks versus whites, and it's worse in other states. Uh, there's an excellent report by the ACLU on this issue if people want to learn more. Um, but we have to realize that ending cannabis-related uh, racist patterns of arrests, why it is absolutely critical, it is not the only issue that affects equity related to cannabis. And if cannabis use increases, we will see some of these other equity issues um, being exacerbated. So let's look at a couple of them. Um, first of all, cannabis and brain development, the most vulnerable periods um, when cannabis affects brain development are pregnancy and adolescence. Um, cannabis use in pregnant women is rising significantly. For young women, it's about one in five women. And at the same time, um, there's a declining perception of risk, both in, for use in general and for use during pregnancy. But we know that smoking cannabis during pregnancy is associated with low birth weight. Um, our own research in California is showing that the more dispensaries within a 15 minute drive from a pregnant woman's house, the more likely she is to be using uh, cannabis during pregnancy. This was a paper we published last year, actually this year. Uh, in JAMA. And so we have pre-existing health disparities in our country, like there's huge health disparities in the incidence of low birth weight and premature birth. I'm a pediatrician, that problem has been around since long before I started training in the 80s, and it hasn't gone away. Um, so if differential rates of cannabis use during pregnancy occur, um, we can see, we would expect to see exacerbation of this important pre-existing health disparity. Um, and that may apply to other health conditions. There are a few really scary studies um, coming out. Um, I don't want, like scaring people, but this was one that recently emerged from a major NIH study of adolescent um, cognitive development. And the cohort is starting at age nine and they recruited over 11,000 um, nine-year-olds and found that 6% had been exposed to cannabis um, prenatally and they found really significant effects on the neurologic um, and psychological development of these children at age nine who had been exposed in utero, including more psychotic-like episodes, lower cognition, changes in gray matter volume, and other effects um, that are very, very worrisome and you know, really need to be an alarm bell uh, for us as a society to be careful. Um, this slide I've been showing for a long time, but it's a classic study done in New Zealand that looked at people uh, who were using cannabis before age 17 and where they were by age 30. Um, and it found really a halving of high school completion rates for people who were using daily, um, as well as similar impacts on degree attainment, not so much on depression or welfare, um, but that impact on high school uh, completion 
is another type of alarm bell we should be aware of. The data on the effects on psychosis and schizophrenia are also growing. Um, and in particular with the transition to a more potent cannabis market, we're seeing um, a threefold increase of uh, psychotic incidents with uh, daily use of cannabis and daily use of what they called high potency cannabis, which was really just over 10% was associated with a five-fold increase um, in the occurrence of psychotic episodes. And when they looked at that and tried to analyze it epidemiologically and asked the question, well, what percentage of total psychotic episodes in the population um, would be due to high potency cannabis, they estimated about 12%, which is a really worrisome number for those of you who work in mental health and substance abuse and, and for us as a society. Um, it, we don't do very well with uh, serious mental illness as it is. And at the same time, we're seeing serious increases in use, particularly by young adults uh, with national uh, youth marijuana use at a 35 year high by 2018 um, with 25% of college students and 27% of same age high school graduates reporting use in the last, um, in the preceding 30 days. Again, most worrisome is when people are using daily or near daily, and that also um, went up dramatically. It had been very high in the 80s, declined significantly in the 90s, um, and is now uh, back up again. We also saw the doubling in a single year of vaping of both marijuana and nicotine between 2017 and 2018. That slowed a little bit with the vaping epidemic, um, but is still uh, very high. In particular, we're seeing three areas where um, the cannabis industry is really borrowing from Big Tobacco's playbook. Um, these are manipulating um, the potency of their products in ways that increases the risk of both addiction and psychosis, creating flavored and other diverse products <clears throat> which are clearly aimed at attracting youth, and shameless and misleading marketing of products including with exaggerated health claims and so forth. This is um, a quote from Judge Kessler in the uh, classic lawsuit of US v. Philip Morris. Um, and it was a racketeering and conspiracy. Um, um, if I get that right, I'm not a lawyer uh, <laughs> suit. But she concluded, defendants have long known that nicotine creates and sustains an addiction to smoking and that cigarette sales and ultimately tobacco company profits depend on creating and sustaining that addiction. Defendants have designed their cigarettes to precisely control nicotine delivery levels and provide doses of nicotine sufficient to create and sustain addiction. This was what the tobacco industry was doing. And this is today what the cannabis industry is doing, whether intentionally or not is irrelevant. It may be just to give people a better high, um, but we are seeing very similar trends. So there's been a complete transformation of the cannabis market. It's no longer your mama's marijuana. Um, it's moved from traditional cannabis to almost entirely um, sensimia with very high potency. Um, and those high potency products are associated with greater risk of depression, anxiety, dependency, and psychosis. So to what extent are our cannabis policies addressing these challenges? When I look at California, our laws are allowing rampant marketing, place no restrictions on potency or flavors except for edible doses. Health and therapeutic claims are allowed. They're not supposed to be misleading, but it's not being monitored or enforced. There are no limits on the number of licenses unless local government creates them. Health warnings are only required in pretty much invisible six point font. There are no state equity provisions in licensing, but some of the positives do include um, local control, uh, ability to tax locally, um, expungement of criminal records and decriminalization and the requirement for a specialized business model. So it's not all bad, but it really needs to be much, much better. And just this year, we're seeing new threats to weaken the regulatory framework. So 
Uh, there's a bill that we're working against that will re-legalize billboards, which had been illegal and then legal, and um, they want to make um, they're illegal right now, but they want to make them legal again. There's a bill that will allow smoke-filled cannabis restaurants and bars, undermining smoke-free air progress, and another bill that will allow adulteration of food with hemp-derived cannabinoids. Um, and it's just a nonstop uh, flow of these uh, proposals. So the result is a market that looks like this. Um, the cannabis industry has a kid's menu of flavored products because just like the tobacco industry, we let them. We're seeing pink animal cracker pre-rolls, grape flavored blunts with added concentrates to be extra potent, cannabis infused root beer, plus pride rainbow sherbet. Um, this is a one of the ones that worries me the most. It's a, a vaping cartridge. It looks just like Juul, grape flavored, the equivalent of about 30 joints from when I was growing up um, with no real indication how potent it is. And we're also seeing just as the tobacco industry did with its marketing as a wellness product, asthma cigarettes, um, we're seeing the same thing with the tobacco, with the cannabis industry, framing their products as wellness products, um, that can knock out pain, depression, and appetite loss. It can improve depression no matter how severe um, and so forth. And these claims are really all over the market. Um, we're seeing billboards that imply that it can fix anything that ails a beautiful young black woman, um, that it will deliver more joy than dogs and babies combined. And these are littering California highways. Um, Joe Camel has been resurrected um, by the, the Corova company now as a cow instead of a camel. And we see cannabis lounges with on-site consumption and smoke-filled environments. So is this the legal weed market that people wanted or voted for? Um, it really combines high and growing levels of exposure with greater mass commercialization of risky products. And that comes together as a formula for significant population health harms. So let's talk briefly about what we could or should be doing to address this situation. First of all, I think, um, you know, full disclosure, the evidence base for cannabis policies is still nascent. The articles are just coming out. The evaluations are just starting. So we really need to use lessons from tobacco control and other fields to provide guidance um, but the fact of the matter is the real world won't wait. Um, the cannabis industry is charging ahead and we must advocate, regulate and legislate amongst this uncertainty to the best of our ability, um, which creates a challenging situation, but one that we can't avoid. So I'm gonna describe uh, sort of our best shot at what could be guiding principles for the uh, regulation of the industry at this time. First of all, we need to address the uh, key issues of unjust incarceration and expunge criminal records that never should have existed automatically. We need to allow, if we are legalizing, we need to allow legal access in a way that minimizes or eliminates the profit drive um, and is structured in ways so that it doesn't drive up consumption. One way to do this is to use local public or nonprofit monopolies to manage the cannabis industry instead of uh, the equivalent of Weed Mart. Um, we should be creating authority to regulate products and not just issue licenses. One of the problems we're seeing in California is the state almost doesn't regulate products. It issues a license to a retailer or a manufacturer, but it's not placing limits on what those products can contain or look like to a large extent. There are some limits on contaminants and so forth. We need to limit this. Um, tremendous uh, charge to product diversification and increasing potency um, if we want this market to be less harmful. And we need to prohibit designs and flavors attractive to youth. Those of you who've worked in tobacco know that for many years we've been working to get rid of flavored tobacco products um, and all the inventions that the industry has come up with to attract and initiate um, youth. So it it is just mind boggling that we have allowed this new legal industry of cannabis to emerge and market exactly the same products that we're trying to get rid of in tobacco and in some cases have successfully gotten rid of. And that's what we're seeing in California. Um, we have to learn from tobacco in our regulation of price. The product should be taxed 
uh, it should be taxed based on potency, which New York just did. That revenue should be captured and used for prevention and for protecting youth or other social investments. Um, we should be prohibiting discounting and coupons and all of those other um, manipulations of price. Um, we know that price affects uh, use by youth for tobacco and we expect that it will in similar ways for cannabis. We need to limit the number and the footprint of retailers. So if you're legalizing, you probably want to have enough to provide some level of legal access, but not so much that it's encouraging and increasing use and need to compete to survive by getting more and more people to use. It should remain a specialized business. So we don't want this to be like tobacco that's sold in pharmacies and grocery stores. Let them be either delivery or storefront um, cannabis businesses. Um, and there's still a lot of question about whether a delivery only model is better than a storefront only model. That's something we're still trying to figure out and keep them away from schools and other facilities that serve young people. We need to limit marketing to the maximum extent possible. And we do get into some complex first amendment law issues here. Um, I'll leave that to Hudson, um, but being creative and trying to figure out how far we can push without uh, passing laws that will not be supported. And we need to warn and inform consumers using the best practices from tobacco control, like graphic warning labels, which no state is using at present. Uh, this is just an example of warnings that we designed that could be provided to consumers, along with another sheet on how to use more safely if you are using. Um, we need to protect our gains in smoke-free air, um, including not allowing on-site consumption or outdoor licenses, um, or we will move backwards in time. And that's the threat we're seeing in California right now. Um, this is an outdoor license at a concert, Grand Slams and Golden Gate Park, believe me, is full of cannabis events right now. We need to preserve local control, not allowing preemption um, of local control not allowing conflicts of interest in regulatory and advisory bodies. And I recommend keeping cannabis regulation to the greatest extent possible under public health. It took us hundreds of years to get tobacco under the FDA. We should be starting cannabis regulation under public health authority so that we don't have to fight for it later. People think um, in many cases of cannabis legalization as an equity issue, but I think that what makes or breaks equity and cannabis policy is much more complicated. We need to end the unjust manifestations of criminal justice and we can't put people in jail again to protect the um, well-funded investors who are coming into the legal market. Um, we need to create a strongly regulated system that's not surviving by pushing consumption and preying on the most vulnerable. And we need to capture tax and capture that tax for equity purposes. So equity in licensing and in hiring is important if you're allowing for-profit licensees, um, hiring more so if you're only allowing nonprofit licensees, um, but um, it's not the only issue that affects equity. So in summary, we can do better. Um, many of these ideas have been adopted somewhere in California and these on our website, you can find a map with examples of local action, um, some of which are really great. Um, New York and Connecticut's recent laws are better, including taxing um, by THC content, prohibiting discounts, um, pledging to not drive up consumption, uh, Connecticut capped potency, for example. Um, we have wonderful examples from Quebec where they built on their alcohol monopoly uh, to create a cannabis monopoly that's allowing legal access with the pledge not to increase consumption and with strong product limits. This is what their products look like with plain packaging and prominent labels. Our project um, is offering a number of tools, including our principles, um, local cannabis policy scorecards modeled after the American Lung Association scorecards, model retailing, marketing, and taxation laws, although these were designed for California. But most importantly, we need you. We need behavioral health and social justice leaders coming to the table because the only people who are showing up now are the cannabis industry. We need to have people who are concerned about these effects present in the debate. Um, 
to stop cannabis from becoming the next tobacco industry. So please get mad, learn what, about what's happening in your community and state, speak out and speak up, build coalitions so that we can get the good from legalization without the bad. Um, this is our project. You can join our listserv. I'll put the information in the chat subsequently. Um, we provide technical assistance within the limits of our capability to states and organizations and local government. Um, and we'd be happy to walk to talk or, or work with you. Thank you. Hudson, you're on mute. I knew I forgot to do something. That's why when I asked Lynn if, if my screen was sharing correctly, I was talking to myself. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you everybody for coming to our presentation on um, cannabis equity um, and public health. I um, am Hudson Kingston. I'm a staff attorney at the Public Health Law Center as um, Carrie so, so uh, nicely said at the beginning. Um, and I am going to be presenting on um, cannabis regulatory options using the state of Michigan as a case study. Um, I wanna thank our research assistant, Edmund Pine, without whose help I would not have been able to do this presentation. He was really, really wonderful at tying all this information together. And I also wanna emphasize that I'm not an expert on Michigan law. This is not legal advice, as Carrie said. This is really sort of a, a what if um, in applying a lot of the principles that Lynn has tied together and seeing how they could be effectuated in uh, a Midwestern state like Michigan that has had legalization, um, but hasn't necessarily had all of the public health um, measures that they could have um, put, into, put into either state or local law. So just a quick uh, agenda for what I'm gonna be talking about. I'm gonna lay out how legalization and local, local control work in the state of Michigan. Then I will be working through um, a publication that Lynn uh, showed at the end of her presentation, Principles for Protecting Youth, Public Health and Equity and Cannabis Regulation. And we'll be sharing that um, document in the chat if you wanna follow along. Um, I will be talking about how viable each of the 20 principles in that document appears to be for local governments in Michigan. Um, and then I'll be handing it back to Carrie for a Q&A. So real quick, um, the legalization of marijuana uh, in Michigan started in 2018, although medical marijuana was uh, legalized in 2008. The state law uses marijuana with an H. I'll, I'll be saying it with a J if that makes any difference, but I, I know this whole presentation is about cannabis. It, as far as I can tell in uh, Michigan law, it's marijuana with an H. Um, so the statewide regulation is done under the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, or what normally people call the Department of Commerce, not under the Health Department, um, and therefore uh, it's, it's being done in terms of normal licensing of businesses. And then local jurisdictions can opt out of legal sales entirely, and they have the authority to regulate reasonably. 1,400 jurisdictions have totally opted out, and then 106 allow some sort of uh, establishment. So it's a very small number of jurisdictions that currently allow marijuana businesses, but it's also some of the biggest jurisdictions. So population wise, it can be a very large amount of the state, even though it's a, a comparatively small number. Okay, so in Michigan, um, Michigan has home rule authority at local level. So um, municipalities have very broad authority to do things. Um, to protect public health and safety, to regulate businesses, to take care of, of their residents. Um, they can be limited by, by state statute, and they often are. But other than that, if, if the state law is silent on something, very often locals in, in Michigan can regulate at the local level. Counties have a much more limited authority, really only extending to county affairs. But at the county level, there are local health departments and they have statutory authority to set rules to protect public health. Those rules have to be approved by um, local counties that, that are coextensive with the local health departments. But then once they are approved, uh, local health department regulations can supersede municipalities laws that are not consistent. Um, so how does preemption work? We, we know that local jurisdictions have strong authority 
but there are ways that um, that authority can be taken away by a higher level of government, in this case, the state government. So there's three main ways to think about this. There's express preemption, where a law says municipalities may not. Um, there's uniform state regulatory schemes. So for example, how the power lines work in your city has to match how the power lines work in another city or else the whole network won't work. So, so there are certain places where, where the locals just don't have the authority because a uniform scheme is necessary for the whole state. And then um, there, there is preemption whenever an ordinance permits what the legislature pr has prohibited or when it prohibits what the legislature permits. And I'm gonna show a long quote from a case, uh, a court case at the Michigan Supreme Court here, don't get scared off. But basically what this long quote says is that if both the state has prohibited something and the locals have also prohibited it, that should be fine. That's not preempted. Unless or, the locals are allowed to go further than what the state has prohibited. But if the state affirmatively allows something, that's where there is a conflict. So if the state said that you could um, fire your handgun on Tuesday and the local jurisdiction said you can't, then that's preemption. But if the, the state hasn't affirmatively given that right, then, then the local jurisdiction can be more, uh, they can have higher prohibitions than are found at the state level. So I'm gonna be talking uh, throughout my presentation about something called section six from the Michigan Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act, that law in 2018. For anyone who's a real stickler, section six is actually section 3332756, and it has this very long name, um, but it's referred to as section six. Um, in section six, there is express preemption. It says a municipality may not adopt an ordinance that restricts the transportation of marijuana. And also they're not allowed to um, prohibit uh, these marijuana businesses from co-locating in the same places from basically having both a production facility and a retailer. But really this is the only express preemption in section six. And it's really only uh, stopping municipalities from, from putting barriers to transportation. Um, other than that, is there a uniform regulatory scheme? No, uh, section six is very clear that a municipality can completely prohibit businesses or limit the number of businesses in its boundaries. And it also can adopt ordinances that are not unreasonably impracticable and do not conflict with the, the statewide law, um, inclu including uh, regulating the time, place, and manner of operation of the marijuana establishments. Um, it does limit um, the fines that a local government can do to only $500, and it limits a license to fee to only $5,000 a year. Um, but generally speaking, locals have fairly broad authority. And specifically, it's this phrase here, the manner of operation of marijuana establishments that really seems to be a broad grant of authority. Um, if you can regulate how someone sells something, then you can really regulate what, what they're doing um, down to a pretty, pretty small uh, extent. One thing to keep in mind, though, is when we talk about preemption, it specifically says that it it does not allow regulations that conflict with this act or with any rule promulgated pursuant to this act. So that would be any um, rule that the Department of Licensing has that may um, go beyond what is in the statute existingly, existing right now. Um, so this is a bit of a moving target because the agency is still promulgating rules and they might put out a rule tomorrow that, that goes so far as to stop locals from, from regulating on a particular topic. But just to remind you, this, this long quote that I will not read out loud, I swear, um, from City of Detroit v. Qualls explains that generally speaking, if, if the state prohibits something and the locals go further, the courts have no problem with that. It's only when the state affirmatively allows something that the, the local governments can't prohibit it. Okay, so we're gonna go through all of the principles in Lynn's document. I'm going to try to go through them quickly, but there's quite a few of them. There's three on protecting children and youth. There's three on promoting equity, mitigating harm from the war on drugs. Um, there's three on averting the emergence of a new tobacco-like industry. And then there's five on protecting public health and six on limiting the dangerous product diversification and marketing. 
Um, I'm going to ask that Stephanie drop this in the chat right now if she hasn't already, but you can get the, these doc, this document from uh, Lynn's website, getting it right from the start. I'll be using, um, in the rest of this uh, presentation, I'll be using traffic lights. And this is not me grading the state of Michigan on how well it's doing. It's actually the traffic lights are going to represent whether a local jurisdiction can do the thing that's in the principle. So um, just really going one by one and, and figuring out if there's local control. Okay, so the three about protecting children and youth. Um, first one, eliminate the cannabis kids menu. So this is really talking about um, products that are attractive to youth, um, flavored products, and products that resemble candy. Um, limiting the number of outlets to fewer than one per 15,000 population and requiring buffer zones between real retail outlets and schools. Um, so let's take these slightly out of order. Um, can locals in Michigan limit the number of retail outlets to fewer than one per 15,000 people? Yes, it seems like they can. Section six is explicitly says that they can completely prohibit the number of marijuana establishments and they can limit the number um, operating in the jurisdiction. So municipalities in Michigan already have caps on the number of re retailers or other marijuana establishments in their existing ordinances. It seems very clear that this can be done at the local level. How about requiring buffer zones between retail outlets and schools, public libraries, and other youth serving facilities? Again, yes. Um, the state statute actually already does this to some extent. Um, it prohibits establishments within um, residential zoning and then within a thousand feet of an existing school. Um, locals can limit that thousand feet, but they can also go further. They can, they can do their own zoning and say that uh, jurisdiction or that establishments are only allowed in specific zones in specific parts of the city. Um, and they could also have limits like the distance limit from schools that would apply to public libraries and other youth serving facilities. This definitely seems like a green light to me based on what I've seen so far. Um, on this other principle, eliminating the cannabis kids menu, it's more of a yellow light um, that's prohibiting products, packaging, or marketing that is attractive to children or youth. First of all, the state rule has that already for edibles specifically, so just for one type of marijuana product, but they cannot be made to appeal to people under the age of 18, and they cannot be associated with or have cartoons, characters, toys, designs, shapes, labels, or packaging that would appeal to minors. Um, edibles also can't uh, be look-alike candy products and they cannot have animal, human, or fruit shapes. Um, and it requires opaque child-resistant packaging. But this is just for edibles. So keep in mind, the principle is about all, tobacco, or all, all marijuana products. The state rules really only extend to one kind. The state rules also uh, to the advertising restrictions say that marijuana products in general must not be advertised or marketed um, to the public unless there's reliable evidence that no more than 30% of the audience or readers from the whoever, uh, whatever media is using this are under the age of 21 or if you're advertising medical marijuana, 18. So you can you have to be advertising in, in media that are 70% or more adults who are able to, um, to actually purchase your products. So at the local level, um, there, there does seem to be authority to do things uh, under this principle. You can um, pass rules that are not unreasonably impracticable and do not conflict with the act. Um, Kalamazoo, for example, has set the age of youth appealing, marketing, or packaging at under, 20, under 21 instead of under 18. So Kalamazoo has already gone further than state law and imposed a higher age limit. However, um, it is also the case that regulating speech of businesses saying that they can't say certain things could very well violate the First Amendment of the US Constitution if you're very specific about what they can or cannot say. Um, it's, it's a bigger issue than we're gonna get into uh, today. But basically, the First Amendment doesn't allow you to, to discriminate against specific ideas. Um, so, so it would be very hard to do this without being very careful about how you drafted um, the ordinance and, and try to stay away from censoring specific ideas. And specifically, I, I want to again bring your attention to the fact that, that these things could be preempted um, if any rule promulgated pursuant to this act already covered the issue. 
So there are um, there are existing rules on marketing. Like I said, there are existing state statutes and, and rules. Um, so so this is a yellow light as well because you would want um, you would want to make sure that the local ordinance is consistent with the, the statewide um, prohibitions. Okay, the next three principles: decriminalization of um, marijuana, which Carrie already talked about, capturing tax revenue. Um, for substance abuse uh, use specifically, and priori prioritizing equity in licensing and in hiring requirements for these businesses. So decriminalization, um, as Carrie said, this really doesn't usually come with legalization. It, it comes um, as a separate piece of legislation. Sometimes they're paired together. In the state of, in the case of Michigan, they didn't come exactly at the same time. Not all of them anyway. So the state law allows possession of 2.5 ounces of um, marijuana or 15 grams of concentrate with no criminal sanction. It'll, it limits um, what locals can penalize to only a $500 fine. And then two years after the law changed uh, to legalize marijuana, there le legislation passed that really speeded up um, some of these decriminalization and expungement efforts at the state level. So the state attorney general has a website that I linked to there that gives a lot of information for people who want to get um, their criminal record expunged and remove convictions from their records so that they don't have to say that they're a former former offender when they're you know trying to get a, a student loan or trying to get a job or something like that. So this has already all happened at the state level. Um, locals can go further. They can um, advocate for more expungement, expungement reform. For example, automatic expungement isn't going to start in the state until 2023, um, but, but it would be great if that was faster. Um, the, they can provide information at the local level about expungement and hire staff to um, provide technical assistance to people who might need some help navigating what is a fairly complicated legal system. And then at the local level, um, they can have police departments deeper prioritize any enforcement of these types of laws or, or remove local um, offenses. You know, obviously, if you walk around with three ounces of marijuana, that's still going to be a punishable offense in the state of Michigan. But police can be can be made to um, deprioritize that and focus on other crimes and not focus so much on trying to search people because they may have a large amount of marijuana on them. So those are all things that can be done at the local level. And generally, you don't need to even pass a local ordinance to do any of those three things. OK, so capturing most or all tax revenue for substance abuse prevention and treatment, education, and mitigating um, the war on drugs. How much money is available in the first place? Well, um, the state uh, has an excise tax. And they set 15% of that aside for local jurisdictions that allow legal sales. So for the 2020 fiscal year, it meant that if you had one establishment in your in your town, you got $28,000. That um, that is a pretty good amount of money to fund um, substance abuse prevention and treatment, but it really isn't very much money to uh, fund you know everything that a local government want, might want to do. So as this this um, principle points out, you really need to set aside almost all of the money towards equity if if it's going to have an impact on equity. And the Michigan Municipal League has put out some pretty good information saying that um, municipalities really do have discretion to um, spend money for public purposes. So substance abuse or public education, those definitely would be public purposes, but they're not really allowed to do public gifts or private gifts or donations. So they couldn't do what has been done in one place in Illinois and set people up with, with housing support because they can't give money away to specific people. Um, they wouldn't be able to do baby bonds or a universal basic income. But they can do things like create youth centers, provide services to over 60 year old people and create economic development corporations. So there's lots of different ways to do reparations for the war on drugs. The options are available. Um, another one of the principles is prioritizing equity in licensing and hiring. The state already has a program for this. So there's a social equity program that exists. It lowers the licensing fees for people who qualify for the program. Nearly 300 businesses um, are, are registered as having a social equity plan on the state website. And they um, those sec social equity plans uh, impact the hiring of diverse people. So because the, the 300 businesses intend to hire 
diverse people, there will be better equity in the hiring requirements. Um, so, so that is happening already at the statewide level. Municipalities could um, help foster this by limiting businesses in their jurisdiction to only being those that have that are in the social equity program. Um, you know, there are those that are in and there's those that are out and and locals definitely have the authority to limit how many um, businesses operate and they might make it a qualification of licensing that they are a social equity program. Um, I would say that there's a big constitutional issue if you try to condition um, benefits on things like race. Um, so it would be best if um, local jurisdictions did not condition the licensing on rate, the race of the applicants, but rather stuck with the state program and whether the state has determined they were a social equity applicant or not. Okay, the next three uh, policies are to avert the emergence of the new tobacco industry. Um, favor public or nonprofit monopoly models to allow legal access without creating a profit-driven market. The example uh, that Lynn gives is, is from Canada. Is that possible in the US? Well, the answer is sort of. Um, there's the example of North Bonneville, Washington, where the business isn't necessarily owned by the local government, but it's owned by a public development authority associated with the local government. And they keep their money absolutely separate from the money of the city. So the city does obtain taxes from the sales on that, from that local business, but they don't directly control it and they don't directly get the money from it. The reason that it's, it's different between Quebec where they're allowed to have a public uh, monopoly and, and here in the US is you have to keep in mind that owning a marijuana store is still a felony at the federal level. Most local governments can't can't even think about owning the business themselves and running it themselves. A few states have proposed public ownership. Um, it was proposed in New Mexico by some Republican legislature, legislators and by the Rhode Island governor who is now the US Department of Commerce head. Um, but that hasn't passed at any state level because it is still a federal felony to run one of these businesses. By contrast, locals could regulate a monopoly. So they could say we're only going to allow one license for our for our jurisdiction. That license maybe is going to be given to a nonprofit and and then they can regulate what that business does, but they they should not, I mean, I I have not seen any good examples of of uh US uh government owning one of these businesses. Okay, preserving local control. That's a big green light for Michigan, as we already discussed. This is sort of the theme of my, my presentation. Section, section six preserves most local control. Um, so, so local jurisdictions can innovate new policies. Um, I have a red light and a green light here, prohibit conflicts of interest. We've we have um, in the Michigan medical system, there are boards and panels at the state level, but there isn't really such a thing as far as I can tell um, for recreational marijuana. So the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs is really calling the shots without any input, at least not regular input from the Department of Health or local departments of health. So there's sort of a red light here at the state level. But at the local level, it's a green light. Municipal governments definitely could partner with the Department of Health and forbid conflicts of interest in any boards they create. Okay, now we're getting near the end. So we have more principles to get through. These are the protecting public health principles from the document. Um, can uh, jurisdictions assure that not driving, they're not driving increased consumption is a system goal and place public health authorities in leadership roles? Similar to what I just said, both of these um, do not appear to be goals at the state level. They do not appear to be things that are happening at the state level, but they could be prioritized at the local level. Um, so, so locals could stop um, local uh, businesses from expanding beyond control and they could place uh, health, health leaders in leadership roles. Um, can they require prominent health warnings in stores and provide safe user information to consumers? Well, there's already state standards for this to some extent. They, state law requires an information pamphlet be made available to consumers about safe use and municipalities and local departments of health likely could uh, require warning signs as regulation um, in, of the manner of marijuana retailing. They probably, it, it would probably not be a great idea to do a bunch of informational pamphlets. The state's already sort of occupying that field. 
Um, how about informing vulnerable groups of the risk of use, such as low birth weight, psychosis and schizophrenia and other mental health effects? Well, state law does have warnings on this exact stuff. They have um, warnings on product packaging that about use during pregnancy will harm the child, um, as well as warnings about driving under the influence and youth access. Locals could require, likely require signs at point of sale on these topics um, as a regulation of the manner of retailing. I, I doubt that they would necessarily be able to do more labels in addition to the three that's already required um, at the state level. Extend smoke-free air restrictions to consistently prohibit smoking and vaping cannabis indoors. Um, so state law actually is not super strong on vaping. It, it only defines smoking to include tobacco. Um, and it does not include e-cigarette use and it does not include marijuana, but there is a state, the state uh, legalization law prohibits consuming marijuana in public, which is an even stronger standard than the existing smoking standards for tobacco products. Jurisdictions that allow establishments are allowed to permit or prohibit on-site consumption. And if they allow it, they could prohibit smoking and vaping, but allow other forms. So allow edibles, but not allow smoking or vaping. Locals have the authority to adopt uh, stronger smoking and vaping standards, um, especially local health departments could, could be thinking about doing um, jurisdiction-wide prohibitions on smoking and vaping that include both tobacco and marijuana. Okay, we're in, I think, our last batch of um, principles, and these are about limiting product diversification and marketing. So limit the THC content requiring stocking of lower THC products and standardize the THC doses or prohibit the flavor or additives. So state law doesn't regulate flavors right now. And there is uh, the promise in law of having THC maximums for edibles, but um, the, the uh, agency, as far as I can tell, has not put out that those maximums yet. So they're in law, they intend to set maximums, but they have not done so. Um, and then state law requires marketers to comply with all state laws, local ordinances, and sign and advertising rules. So, uh, and it also prohibits false, misleading, and deceptive advertising. So state law itself acknowledges that there will be local controls on advertising that uh, are, is known to attract children, for example. So section, section six, uh, says that they can, uh, locals can establish reasonable restrictions on public signs related to these businesses. And um, it also could be done just uh, on a restraint on the manner of retailing. Um, it, it is not as clear whether um, they could uh, change the way the product is made, but they definitely could um, prohibit the sale of certain products. So products that are the stronger ones within their local jurisdiction. Um, it might be interesting to know that for medical marijuana, locals are preempted from regulating the purity of the products, but I don't think that that necessarily applies to um, the regulation of recreational marijuana. Okay, limit product diversification and marketing. Three of these um, are about um, uh, aggressive cannabis marketing to youth and children, requiring warning labels, uh, and prominent pictorial warnings and prohibit therapeutic or health claims for cannabis products. Generally speaking, state law already does a lot of these things. It requires warning labels as we've already talked about. And it also requires labels to indicate how much marijuana or THC are in edibles. Um, state law also prohibits any health claims at all unless they've been signed off on by the federal FDA. Um, and it prohibits false, misleading, and deceptive advertising. So, so most of these things in the principles are already taken care of at the state level. Um, at the local level, um, they might prohibit selling products without the warnings, but probably um, would not be able to, at the local level, re require additional labeling. And then also, just like we said before, whenever you're regulating speech, there's a possible First Amendment constitutional issue. And it's better to regulate the time, manner, and place of advertising than what it specifically says. Although it is true that you can always prohibit false or illegal statements. Okay, using a specialized business model for retailers is another principle. Um, state law prohibits selling tobacco at an enterprise, and it seems quite likely that municipal or local health departments 
can prohibit co-sale of food or drink and marijuana as a regulation of the manner of retailing or to protect public health as the case may be. Okay, so sorry, um, I talked way too long, but our, our conclusions are not many principles are preempted, but some may be unconstitutional if, if implemented in the wrong way. Municipalities have a broad authority to regulate the manner that marijuana is sold and likely have um, a lot of authority under their home rule standards. Local health departments have complementary authority over things like smoking standards and may be able to set regulations that go across jurisdictions. And if the state becomes much more active in regulating, it's possible that it will preempt a few more things that um, locals can do. But other than a lot of uh, state laws on labeling, um, it doesn't seem that there's a lot of preemption of this kind yet. And this is our contact information. I'm so sorry that we're already one, one minute past the hour. And um, I hope that uh, Carrie can perhaps feel the send a few. I'll begin to wrap up, but I, I, Hudson, this was great information. Lynn, wonderful information. We do, um, we probably should have scheduled this for a little bit longer, but I, if people uh, are willing to hang on, we do have a few questions. I'll ask uh, folks and, uh, we will do our best to follow up with people if we haven't been able to respond to any of their questions. And I, I can't imagine that we'll have time to get to all of them. There are quite a few. Um, I'm going to ask um, perhaps Hudson, will we ever get to a point where medical cannabis will be covered by Medicaid or Medicare insurance in your view? Um, so I think there's two barriers to this. One, as Lynn said, uh, marijuana is a Schedule One drug, so that would just be a felony and Medicaid will not pay for it currently. So Congress would have to change that. Um, and then in addition, for it to be part of the real, the, the federally regulated medical system, um, the products would have to go through FDA approval. So there are a few cannabis-derived um, uh, products that are approved by the FDA, but the stuff that is sold as medical marijuana in all states has not been approved by the FDA. So it, it will be sort of a long process and Congress will have to weigh in for that. Thank you. Uh, there was a question about um, the, whether or not the, the laws policies that call it marijuana or marijuana with an H instead of cannabis was because uh, if whether or not changing it to, to cannabis would cause the laws and policies to be more complex. And I don't know who would like to respond to that, but I'll, I'll just throw it open. You know, it's a complicated debate. Marijuana, you know, derives from um, a Spanish word that's been used for the product. Uh, the use of the term marijuana was very much associated with the um, actions of the DEA and seeking to demonize marijuana and associate it with immigrant populations. And so on the one hand, some equity advocates um, encourage the use of the term cannabis um, for that reason. Um, on the other hand, the cannabis industry has also used the name change to kind of create a hit, a, try and hit a refresh button with the product and, and have people think that it's not harmful um, or that there's not harm associated with it in addition to whatever uh, medical benefits it may also have. Um, and so it's complicated. I sometimes use marijuana um, intentionally to get away from the cannabis rebranding um, of the industry, but I usually use cannabis if I'm referring to the legal situation in any state, just because the laws are evolving in the direction of using that term. So if I'm in a state I talking about laws, I just talk about whatever it says in their laws. Um, but you like, especially if you're working with um, some of the equity groups, they feel very strongly that the term marijuana is, is and has been so associated with racist policies that they want to dump it. Um, so there's there's mixed feelings about what the right term is to use. I totally agree with Lynn. It's fraught and I try to stick with whatever the law of the jurisdiction uses. Okay, great. Which often reflects awesome. the racist past too. <laughs> right. Okay, I'll throw out one, one more question and then I guess we'll wrap it up uh, just to be considerate to our, our viewers. Um, there are many therapeutic uses for cannabis. Most are understudied. How do you think more evidence of the benefits of cannabis 
will change policies limiting the industry. And again, I'll let um, either of you respond. I'd like to kick in with some comments. I think we can have an industry, and I, I really saw it in action when I visited the Quebecois uh, dispensary that intentionally seeks to not promote consumption, but is still an attractive environment with you know reasonably nice products. Um, not overly nice, they use plain packaging, just like we encourage for, for tobacco. Um, but they sell products, they have explanations of the characteristics of different products and how they affect you and, you know, oh, it's a pleasant place to shop and so forth. Um, so I don't think it has to be, um, you know, a disagreeable environment, just like an alcohol monopoly is, can be a nice store. Um, in Sweden, where I used to live, the alcohol monopoly was quite nice for people to shop in. Um, but the, we have to be aware that we're definitely going to see more uses emerge. The cannabinoid pharmacology is fascinating and it has really interesting effects, um, but it's going to take a lot more research to understand what's hogwash and a lot of the current claims are hogwash and what are legitimate um, medical benefits. Um, but that's not going to make the recreational, the harms of the recreational use market disappear. So we're going to see a coexistence of certain uh, evidence-based medical uses and that those will probably grow. Well, some of them will grow and then a lot of the ones that are currently in our laws are gonna get, you know, are gonna be proven to be not, not correct um, or not substantiated by the evidence. But the much, much, much bigger market is the recreational market and the harms associated with the recreational market are, are in, inevitable and are also gonna continue to, to grow um, the more that um, market grows and consolidates and goes from being um, an illegal market to, you know, having Coca-Cola style marketing and Coca, you know, and, and uh, Constellation style, you know, power um, of marketing. And um, we can't ignore those. So it's finding the right balance. That's really challenging. Okay, I do think I'm gonna wrap it up at this point. I wanna thank our panelists, Dr. Lynn Silver and Hudson Kingston. And I wanna thank all of you for attending our webinar. We will be sending out a short evaluation uh, right after this webinar ends along with um, links to the slides and the recording in a few days. So thank you very much for coming and I hope you attend future webinars of ours. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Carrie.